So let's start off today, uh, and let me bring in Colin Kendrick and Ben London. Colin from Austin, Texas, and Ben from, from Seattle. Colin is a founder of what I think is one of the most interesting nonprofits uh, that I've seen emerge in the last 10, 15 years, uh, a nonprofit called Black Fret. Many of you uh, have heard of them, um, and if you haven't heard of them, you're in for a treat. Um, Black Fret is taking head-on one of the most significant issues facing uh, particularly independent musicians, but, but really facing the entire music ecosystem, which is access to capital and access to sustainable income uh, and, and, and the ability for musicians to get uh, the tools and resources necessary to make work, to get down the road and sustain careers. And so Colin, uh, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. And are you muted? I think you're muted. There I we am. are. Thank you for having me. <laughs> there we are. Thank you, Colin. We're thrilled to have you. And, and Ben, thanks for joining us from Seattle. So I asked you guys um, to go ahead and instead of me just yakking at you for 15 minutes, to go ahead and, and <laughs> have an overview presentation that will walk us through uh, the vision of Black Fret, kind of what the organization does. And, and then I'm going to go ahead and, and tee up to do that now. And then after, uh, after we get through that, we'll, we'll open up for some questions and, and some further conversation. And then we're going to be bringing into the conversation uh, one of the musicians who's been a two-time recipient of uh, Black Fret Grants, which is I'm really excited to, to, to have. So, Ben, are you going to run the show here? Yes. Awesome. Let me get things up and running. So we, we put in a couple of video clips just to give people a feel for it, as well as sort of the description. Our music community is seriously under pressure. The rising cost of living and the changing music business have created new challenges for musicians like me. One of us lives in Olympia, so the band is split up. Now it's just challenging to get rent paid. They've just jacked up the prices since I was a kid. The other two of us, we live in low-income housing and also tour and also record and also put records out. These people are the heart and soul of our city. Our creatives are the ones that make Seattle what it is. Here's the magic, people. Oops, backwards. Black Fret provides those who love Seattle music with the opportunity to become a patron of local music. Black Fret members get access to unique, intimate, private music experiences that support grants to musicians. Artist grants are based on excellence, not tied to a specific musical style or genre. Giving musicians resources and education they need to accelerate their careers. Please, join us in becoming a Black Fret member so we can support our local musicians. So you may recognize uh, one of your cohort, Kate Becker there, who's been a great uh, help in us getting launched in Seattle. So let us give you a little background on why Black Fret. So the, the challenges that musicians in Seattle and in Austin are the same that many are, pay, are facing all over the world. And that is the rising cost of living in urban areas, the uh, demonetization of recorded music and that streaming revenue has not caught up and uh, has made it harder. There's a lot of cons concert industry and consolidation that has eliminated a lot of uh, access for emerging artists to perform, uh, particularly opening up for larger national acts, and then most recently COVID-19. So along those lines, uh, you know, both Austin and Seattle are known as music-centric cities. Uh, we're very lucky to have uh, a lot of organizing that's been done uh, to acknowledge our music communities in these regions and understanding the sort of economic driver that they are to our economy, both from a monetary standpoint and also sort of for a cultural identity standpoint. Um, this, in 2016, you can see that, you know, um, in both Austin and Seattle had similar numbers in terms of the amount of money that they brought into the economy. But at the same time, if you look, um, the musicians themselves are not necessarily benefiting at a rate that's survivable. You know, the uh, median income for a musician in Seattle in 2016 was $15,000 a year, and that's virtually impossible to live uh, in Seattle uh, in, that, uh, in that income uh, level. So what about Black Fret? Um, so as a nonprofit, um, our goal, first and foremost, is to empower musicians to create and perform new music. And so we're definitely thinking a lot of ways about the emerging artist, the artist that's getting going. Although uh, to date, we've definitely awarded artists to more that are mid-career or maybe artists that were once uh, higher on the mountaintop and are looking for a resurgence of some sort. But those musicians that need a capital infusion of some sort, uh, along with some education and things of that nature to move their careers forward. So 
Blackfriend, as I mentioned, we're a 501c3 nonprofit, um, public charity. Um, it was founded in 2013 by Colin and, uh, and our partner in crime, uh, Matt Ott. Um, I was drawn to this model. It was actually uh, Michael Bracey, uh, thank you, Michael, that introduced me to Matt and Colin because I went down there saying, uh, we need this in Seattle. You guys are doing this amazing thing. And uh, we quickly hit it off and we were, I'm happy to say that we launched in Seattle in February of 2020. And that now um, we've seen how this model can work, uh, even in spite of COVID and the challenges that it's faced, uh, has placed in front of us. And that now we're working towards a multi-city expansion that we think this is totally scalable. And it's uh, amazing what a small group of people that love music can do to have a large impact in their city. So how does it work? So at, at its core, Black Fret, you know, we connect musicians with uh, the industry and with patrons, so, you know, most importantly. Um, that's where we derive the majority of our revenue at this point. So we're a membership-driven organization. Uh, it costs $1,500 a year for a member slash donor to join. 80% uh, of that's tax deductible. It's eligible for corporate matching. Um, in exchange for that, our members get to attend a series of privately curated events highlighting the best and brightest music in our communities. And then, uh, in addition, they get to be part of our nomination and voting process to determine who gets grants on a yearly basis. And then lastly, once the artists get grant money, we give them access to an advisory board filled of industry professionals that can help counsel them how to best use those dollars and best try to use them as the magnifier that they are. So what's our impact been to date? Colin, do you want to talk a little bit about this? Yeah, sure. And, and I, I think, you know, one point, this all came out of the simple recognition that there was nothing like a symphony or an opera that existed for popular local music in Austin. And we've been working on the concept for a long time and um, it's, it's working. We're seven years in now. We've uh, given away $2 million to over 120 different bands. Um, good reception in Seattle. So, um, we're really encouraged by what we're seeing. Um, you can see there on the stats, you know, we've grown to over 500 members at this point. We're doing well over a million in annual revenue, which makes us about a third the size of the symphony in Austin. Uh, so there's definitely evidence that this can be institutionalized and, and significant. Uh, that 500 members has now pushed out $2 million to artists, another you know, $800,000 invested in you know, stage sound lighting and performance for those artists and with the addition of the Seattle crew that Ben's pushed forward, you know, I think we've broken a total of 150 artists now that are benefiting from those funds. It's about 40 to 50 artists a year in the core program now. Um, based on the belief that we can turn this into something like the symphony, we believe that any individual city, any major individual city has the potential to be pushing out more than a million dollars a year in funding to bands. And that's, that's what we're shooting towards. Gotcha. And just to say, uh, just as a point of clarification, uh, that uh, when we say bands, I mean, that could be a catch-all. It could be uh, individual artists, it, it, and it's not genre or, uh, or age-focused in any way. It's to basically, we want to magnify the best and brightest of what's happening in any city we're in. Yeah. So, so our artists are not just given a check. I'm sorry? Go oh, go ahead. Please go ahead. Um, so the artists aren't just given a check. We use a, a deliverables-based system to distribute the funds. So they're awarded the grant and then they have a course of a year to unlock those dollars. They do that through creation and performance. Uh, and we have different things in a menu that they can choose to do. So they can write new songs, record new songs, release them, tour outside of uh, core markets, do international and do fundraisers for other charities. Um, you know, you, you can see what $2 million has made possible. It's a lot, right? And if you would imagine that on the scale of being in 10 or 15 different cities and $10 million a year, um, the potential to create this enormous body of uh, cultural work uh, is phenomenal. So it's, it's an exciting vision to be able to blow this up. Um, hop on, Ben, to the next one. So I'll just jump in here for a second. Um, you know, just wanted to talk to you a little bit about what we've done since COVID hit. Um, you know, we had, uh, like most uh, organizations, uh, for-profit or non-profit, had to figure out what they were going to do in this new world that we were all facing. And I'm happy to say that um, uh, that Matt and Colin and I, we put our heads together and um, we decided that musicians needed money more than ever. And so while we talked about some of the ways that musicians could unlock grants in the past, we uh, removed those for 2020 
and have accelerated the distribution in $500,000 in grants to musicians. Um, through uh, some funding through Austin, they started an online happy hour series um, where we connected musicians with companies and individuals and over $100,000 has gone to musicians as part of that program. We changed over to live streaming uh, from live events and um, I'd encourage you all, uh, there's a bunch of stuff going on in Austin and we have an eight or a 10 week series that we're two episodes in in Seattle highlighting our 2020 grant recipients. Um, we just announced yesterday uh, a series that's going to happen, an in-person series at uh, ACL Live, where they film Austin City Limits in Austin. That's uh, 250 people in a 2,800-seat room, but in socially distanced pods that can get people back in a room experiencing live music again. And then uh, when South by Southwest canceled, we uh, quickly did a performance there and put, um, Colin, what was the money that was raised out of the Love and Light stream, approximately? It was around $75,000, about 25000 went to the bands that performed that at 25. We raced for the Health Alliance for Austin Musicians because uh, we recognized that they needed it more than we did at the moment. And um, another twenty five was paid to the vendors. The exciting thing about that was it was five days of live streaming, eight hours a day out of Austin. Um, it was the only stage live in Austin during South by Southwest, which normally is hundreds. Uh, and I think as a result, we had almost 200,000 uh, viewers across the globe. So uh, it, was, it was amazing. Great. All right, so here's a little so, bit more of our impact. Well, and let, me, let, me, let me comment real quickly, Ben. Oh, I'm sorry. So when I went... I, I just wanted to preface this, you know, the numbers are great and what we're doing in terms of, Nakia will talk to it, but in terms of helping out and pushing money out, it's great. Um, this next video is one of our grant recipients from 2015 and one of our advisory board members, Matt Nabeski, who's uh, in the band Blue October, owns a major recording studio in town. Uh, Matt is on our advisory board and, and look, money comes and goes. Uh, access to mentoring is more valuable to the artists. And, and what we're envisioning as we blow this out at a national level is the ability for artists from one city to tour either with national acts or artists from another city. It's all about creating, accelerating time to sustainable markets for the bands. How do they get to an audience faster? And this is a story about one of our artists back in 2015 where we had some big success. And I, I want you to see this because I want you to, to understand what the potential is here. Okay. So when I was at the Black Ball, this guy comes out. Ladies and gentlemen, Dave Malone. As soon as he starts, I'm like, this is going to be good. Well, you and I, we should go sailing. It was one of those moments where you hear a song for the first time and you see an artist for the first time, and you're just so in the moment. Nothing else in the world matters right then. It was more powerful than anything I heard that night. And that's no disrespect to anyone else at all. It was just, it spoke to me. I was like, I have to meet this guy. If nothing else, just to tell him what a fan I am. I made it my mission to just do whatever I could to help him out. Reached out to our manager. And Paul instantly was like, something special is happening here. Everybody just connected right off the bat. And then one thing led to another. And we invited him to come out with us on tour. Danny, who'd played in, in rooms, you know, with 100, maybe 200 people playing in a series of coliseums with five to 10,000 people, and that's spectacular. That went so well. He's now on his second tour with us. It's really accelerating their careers. It's really moving things forward in a meaningful way that they understand that they wouldn't have without us. I think Danny is like a case study in this being successful. This is proof that this works. And this is proof that what Black Fret has put into motion actually translates to the right things. We should go so um, we're going to talk a little bit about our vision. We've, we've talked about national expansion here. So our goal is to continue to evolve Black Fret and scale it. And ideally, we create a network of Black Frets around the country that at scale will allow us to not only help artists in the local market, but as Colin connected, uh, or Colin mentioned, start to create connectivity between these different markets and sharing resources, 
um, and the ability to make sure that there's audience when these different artists come to town. Not to mention that as we grow to a more national organization, it opens us up to different fundraising opportunities as well. So Colin, you want to talk this through a little, just a little bit? <clears throat> I think you're muted, Colin. I said, pardon the math. Um, but what I'm, what I'm trying to get across here is we have a big vision um, and we've been hard at work for seven years, uh, but we need help. And it's the people on this call that we are reaching out to for that help. This in Austin is great. This in Seattle is great, but we don't really, I would argue, don't really have the ability to meaningfully change the career of an artist without having a larger national network. And so making Black Friday a national organization is, is critical to what we're doing. Um, and the people on this call are the people with the knowledge and the markets and the know-how that can make that possible. So the ask here is if this is appealing or interesting, we would love to connect with you. So, um, so look, just to give you some sense of the scale here, $1,500 annual dues if we're in 10 cities with 1,000 members, right? That's 10,000 members. We've got 5% of that already, right? So can we 20X this? I think we surely can, right? It, it seems to work. Ben managed to launch Seattle in less than a year. Um, that gives us the ability to be a $15 million a year arts organization pushing out almost $10 million a year in funding to local artists. That's, in the world of arts nonprofits, that's significant. Uh, and we're trying to get that done in the next, you know, five years or so. Um, that's just on membership dues, which at the moment are 65% of our revenue. But um, the interest from... Uh, philanthropy and from foundations and corporations is real. Dell and Deloitte, Whole Foods, they're all been big sponsors of ours. So go on to the next slide. I will. I just wanted for clarity, just to mention too, that when we talk about that membership, that that $1,500 a month allows that member and a guest to come. Year. To all. Yeah, that's per year. So just, just again, I won't dwell on the numbers here, but if you look across the cities we've looked at, and we're looking at a lot of cities, right? This is by no means our target list, but we, you, know, you look at these cities, you can see that Austin is, in most instances, near the bottom on these markets, uh, or at least in the middle, right? And so uh, we would argue that there's plenty of people, there's plenty of money, there's plenty of population density, and if you simply look at the symphonies and operas in those markets, you know, they're running north of a half a billion dollars a year in revenue and upwards of a billion dollars a year in revenue. Just to frame that, the entire North American music industry is about a $50 billion industry. Uh, and by some estimates, you know, 5% of that goes to bands, artists. If that's true, 80% of that is then going to the top 1% of artists or 10% of artists. So what that means is that of that $50 billion, less than a billion dollars is going out to the individual musicians that work in the markets we're, we're trying to help. If that's a billion dollars flowing to artists and Black Friday has the ability to pursue at a national level, those orders of magnitude, you know, if you really hit the skin off the ball on this thing and blew it out, you know, the, the math's, suggest you could double revenue to local musicians. I mean, it's big, it's material, and it's meaningful, and, and we have a vehicle that's working and scaling. Great. So, kind of uh, yeah. things here, you know, we really see that this is a, a hub uh, with many spokes on it and what we can do, and that, you know, we're the different constituencies that we can interact with and support. So, obviously, the musicians we've talked a lot about but conversely, we're creating these unique experiences for music fans and that historically uh, our demographic for membership has skewed a little bit older. But what's great about these folks is that these are people that aren't necessarily going out on a regular basis. So we're opening up new rev revenue streams for, uh, and fans for musicians. Um, as we mentioned that um, our artists can unlock grant dollars and perform for other 501c3 nonprofits. And we've done um, a little bit under $200,000 uh, in grants that have been unlocked to perform for other nonprofits. Um, the music industry and in that we're adding a development layer that's uh, as uh, the major label system and independent label system has been, has uh, shrunk uh, their uh, internal footprints, um, provides development and uh, awareness of artists in these communities that can go on and, and work uh, at a larger level. Um, in terms of the business community, um, you know, I think that we're all aware of the role that, that, that music and culture plays in desirability for people to want to live in cities and that how we can help support and keep musicians in cities that are gentrifying at an extreme pace. 
And then lastly, the sort of government level of a place that they can support where historically they've, um, you know, will write checks to some organizations, but, but the money doesn't actually usually get to the musicians themselves. It's more supporting the infrastructure of other organizations. And so to find a new way to capture charitable giving. And then I'd say that Colin and I and all of us are big fans of, of opera and symphony and things like that. But at the same time, we also understand that the demographics of uh, the people that are into the arts and culture are moving away from symphony, symphonic music and opera and are looking for more of a popular music alternative about how they can give back and invest in their communities. And I feel that Black Fred is in the right place at the right time to capture on those changes as well. So with that being said, thank you very much. We can open it for questions. Yeah, thanks guys. Thanks. Um, I appreciate you putting together that presentation and, and running through it. I know it's a lot of information to try to distill and I know our chat room and our Q and A room is, 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 is blowing out. I want to just ask a couple questions real quick or just make a couple kind of, kind of points. I mean, I think one of the most important things about this um, that I really appreciate is that the whole black fret model is very sort of incremental and solutions driven. And again, you know, Ben, you have a long history as a musician and working in the industry, wearing a number of different hats. And it's like you come to this in Seattle, you know, again, what you laid out in the presentation is like, here's the challenge, here's the disconnect. This is what we have to do. We have to figure out different ways of aligning these resources. And so, you know, I, I think, you know, I, again, for all of us that have been doing versions of this work for a long time, it's incredibly exhilarating to see something that's not just a lot of talk, but it's actually like we're trying some stuff out, like we're, we're, we're really pushing. So that's, that is super exciting. Um, the uh, other piece, which I think is, 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 is probably fairly obvious to the folks who are participating uh, in today's program, but I just think is really important is I think that, again, this is a tangible strategy that reflects that um, there's a fundamental, fundamental disconnect in terms of how most music consumers, how the music industry gears reaching consumers and, and where those consumers live at different points in their life. And so again, not to be ageist or whatever, but to say that for a lot of, I would imagine a lot of the core audience or the core membership of Black Fret, this is an opportunity for them to, who may be at a point in their life where they maybe have professional, you know, they have resources, they have retirement plans, music is critically important to them. They're not out at the clubs anymore as much as they'd like to. They've got a lot of, you know, things going on in their life, but they want to have a tangible yeah. way that they feel like they're being welcomed in. And I love the sort of bridge that you're making between kind of traditional patronage models and understanding that's kind of how, how these other, you know, sort of disciplines have been supported for a long time. And this is a way to kind of apply that to, again, the sector that needs so much support. So yeah, I think- it's sort of I think one of the- what most sort of acknowledging time as a resource as well, that as people get more ensconced in family and work, that if they're going to invest to go out and see live music, they're looking for something that they know is going to be a good experience for them. And so, um, you know, I, again, not to be an ageist, but you can pick up or go online or pick up your alternative weekly and look and see music. And if you don't know who anybody is, you're at a loss. And so we're creating a curatorial layer as well to provide these sort of high quality experiences for uh, our members. Yep. One of the nicest things we, we consistently hear from our members is, look, I'm not giving you my charitable dollars. I'm giving you my entertainment dollars. Yeah. And, and $1,500 is a lot of money. And, and we're, we're actually getting ready to try and roll out some lower cost alternatives there. But um, even at 1500 bucks for two people after tax breaks, you know, you're talking less than $100 a month for two tickets to two shows. $25 for a night out and it's an entire social life in a box and, and the best bands in town or some of the best bands in town or, you know, they play at eight o'clock and nine o'clock and you're out the door and home to your babysitter by 1030. Um, yeah. It, there's a real demand for it. So I want to bring Nikki. Are you, are you uh, with us? Your, I see your uh, cameras turned off. There you are. Awesome. Fantastic. It's always a mystery if our guests are literally there when I just have to call on them. So Nikki, we're thrilled to bring you into the conversation and, Actually, Colin, I'm going to put you in the spot and ask you to, you know, kind of introduce yeah, the audience because this is a gentleman who's involved in a lot of different things. Uh, Nikki and I have uh, been friends for a long time. I've been working on nonprofit ideas for musicians for good 15, 16 years at this point, and he has been one of my go-to sources for uh, guidance on how to how to how to run a healthy and responsible organization. He's also a longtime Austin musician. He uh, performed in season one of The Voice, was a CeeLo Green artist, uh, has now uh, had two grants from Black Fret, um, 
He also runs a, a musician support group or musician I don't know, union. I'll, I'll let him explain it. But Austin, Texas musicians, he helped start in the last year. Uh, and so he is, uh, he served on the music commission with Austin. He is uh, uh, talented and intelligent and uh, gives all of his heart to this. So. Nikia? Wow. Uh, well, thank you, Colin. Yeah, that's, that's a really nice intro introduction. I, I can't say uh, thank you enough. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So no, we're, we're, we're thrilled to have you. So, you know, again, part of what is really exciting about the, this Friday program we do is that so many musicians, you know, are really wearing so many different hats. So they're sustaining careers, they're playing shows, they're making music, they're doing the life. And then they're also looking at sort of the broader <laughs> ecosystem and looking at like, what do musicians have agency in terms of addressing, you know, some of the challenges that are out there and how do we make things better? And so in a minute, we're gonna actually bring in Aaron Myers from Washington DC and talk about your activism and you know, some kind of comparisons about what you're doing locally in Austin and, and some of the same dynamics in DC. I wanna start though and just talk a little bit about, yeah, again, you're a two-time Black Fret grantee. What does that mean? Like, how does that work? What does that feel like in terms of, of competing for those grants? What did that grant allow you to do? What is your sense with the other grantees about like, what is this whole thing? Like, you know, what would just, can you give a sense of kind of the vibe of the, of the thing from an artist standpoint? Yeah, I, you know, uh, I'm sure Colin uh, would be the first to say that, um, you know, I had a lot of questions when he brought it to me. I was, I uh, had a lot of skepticism um, and um, I was, I have was genuinely and continue to be genuinely impressed that every question, you know, that is, is, asked is considered and, and answered in, in, in some way. And they, they really went out of their way to make it about the musicians and trying to empower musicians. Um, they're still getting their, uh, their sea legs, I think, with the, the process. And they, they, would, they would probably be the first to admit that um, because nobody else, else has done this before. You know, this is something completely new. And, and um, again, they're just so open to the feedback from artists. And um, from the, the standpoint of being one of, I think I was in the second or third years when I got my first uh, grant, um, you know, the process was um, really, I think, was very enlightening for me because I was able to not only access, you know, um, some people that I already had uh, connections with through their advisory panel, but some folks that I had always wanted to meet and work with um, that I did not have a connection with yet. And so I got to know more about them. Um, and then when we actually started meeting, you know, and getting artists together, realizing that, gosh, we have this, you know, great community of musicians from all types of genres of music and uh, different people that really just want to put out music. We're all the, the same in that way. We, we just want to create new music and get it in front of fans. Um, along the way, you know, what I, what I realized and, and what I've, you know, consistently said is the, the biggest uh, thing that I think Black Fet really has to offer artists isn't so much the, the cash. The cash is great. It helped me um, fix my credit. It helped me put out uh, two records. Uh, it helped me tour um, internationally for the first time. That's all great, you know. But for 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 me, the exciting thing is this idea of opening these other nodes across the country and having access to uh, a built-in fan base that are dedicated to live music and the musicians who make it. The the people who are going to pay this money to patronize this organization and help uh, musicians like myself and so many others, um, they really care about the music. And, you know, I have played, um, as, as he said, I've went from playing, you know, uh, dirty smoky bars to being in front of 14 million people a week on the voice. And I've been, uh, I've sang at Dodger stadium, all these things. Right. But, um, it's, you never know what you're going to get when you walk into a room, if they're going to be listening, are they going to like you? Are they going to buy merch? Um, I've never played a Black Fred event or attended a Black Fred event where I felt like I had to talk over the band. 
the the respect for the craft and the pers- the presentation is so high and that is it gives me goosebumps just thinking about being on the back of of Colin's house watching these friends of mine present brand new music that I had never heard uh, in front of these audience people who were outside. They could be talking loud and partying and they are having a good time, but they're really plugged into the music. And I think for musicians and, and, and artists everywhere right now, what's more important than any venue gig tour you might get or any of that sort of stuff is building relationships with fans and and man, Black Fret is is really a great way to do that. So we're getting a bunch of great questions. And so I'm going to try to weave some of these together. And, and, and I think one thing I, I, I really want to <clears throat> emphasize, and Colin, Ben, if you disagree with the statement, I welcome your opportunity to push back on it. But I, I think it's important to um, emphasize that Black Fret is not presenting itself as, quote unquote, the answer or the future of the industry. This is a sort of very targeted strategic, you know, sort of platform that can do a lot of good while also trying to engage with all the other broader structural challenges facing the community. Um, you know, so I, I just think, you know, what I've my when I've away from from y'all is a lot of sort of understanding the complexities of the issues facing the broad music ecosystem. And that again, you're not trying to solve everything through one nonprofit, you're trying to do some some important stuff. Um yeah, I mean, we're not we're just no, we're no, we're, uh to artists and that, you know, the mantra I always use is that new problems require new solutions. And yeah. uh, if we just rely on what the market has offered to date, then uh, we're going to all end up living in music deserts um, as yeah. opposed to being the culturally vibrant spaces that drew us to live in these locations already. Yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, we welcome, we partner with a bunch of folks. We welcome everything. And I saw some questions about how the nominations and the voting happens and that, you know, on a yearly basis, we have some different constituencies that are involved in the nomination and voting process, one being our members, one being our advisory board, that's a very diverse group of individuals from different facets of the music industry. And then as years go on, the musicians themselves that were past uh, nominees uh, get a voice in that as well. And uh, <clears throat> just for example, I'm happy to mention that in, um, I'm sorry, let me just pull this up real quick, that in our first year, our first year class in uh, Seattle for grant recipients, it was 27% male, 73% female, 63% BIPOC, and uh, 27% LGBTQ if they publicly identified that way. We did not specifically query uh, people in that. And so I was very happy that felt like a very reflective view of what our community looks like here and uh, where the most exciting music is coming from, frankly. So um, that's awesome. I appreciate that. I mean, p- p- part of p- we're people that care a great deal about the challenges our musicians are facing. And I see Alex is, or Joel is asking on chat about venues closing. And um, I think the commonality here is the solutions we need are, are the cost of the solutions are measured in the tens of millions of dollars. Uh, and I don't know about other cities, but Austin for Austin to find that kind of money is not easy. Like they, yes, they can do a better job, but it, it's a lot of money. Uh, and if, if the community isn't going to organize around that and, and engage in active fundraising, we're not going to solve any of the problems. And so uh, there really has not been a, a vehicle that could go out to the money in Austin and raise it. And, and now there is. So last thing, just being mindful of time, I want to, uh, we could go yeah, on for, I, I've been known to, but at the same time, I want to make sure we have time for our other uh, uh, speakers today. Yeah, no, exactly. So, so we're actually going to kind of pivot Nikki in terms of, a lot of the work that you do. So um, again, we're gonna bring Aaron uh, into the conversation and Anna Chalenza as well. And and just to kind of frame and give some context in, in terms of what you're working with with uh, Austin, Texas musicians, we're gonna show just a kind of a short video of a testimony you gave yesterday uh, in front of, I think the Austin City Council, is that correct? Could you set that up for us? Yeah, so yesterday Austin City Council took uh, was voting on uh, what's called item 62 or saves, um, saving Austin's vital economic economic sectors that Mayor Adler and some other council members brought specifically to address uh, music venues, um, uh, arts venues, restaurants and bars and childcare. Um, I don't know, somehow we got lumped, lumped in there, but um, 
the uh, you know the the issue is is that all summer through the pandemic we've been getting these resolutions, and um, they never specifically create a dedicated music venue fund. And then when it goes out to staff, they and they farm it out to whoever is doing it. The money actually never really makes it to the venues who need it the most or at all. And so um, this was my. Um, moment to tell the uh, the city council to, to remind them that it, it's they're, they're, they need to step up and do a better job. Awesome. Alex, if you yeah, please roll the clip. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Nakia. I am a working musician, the founding president of Austin, Texas Musicians, and a resident of Windsor Park in District One. I'm here today to strongly urge council to include explicit language in Item 62 that creates a dedicated live music venue preservation fund. Our city's marketing department has no problem repeating Austin is the live music capital of the world. So why is it so hard for our city council to put in writing and send to staff a resolution that creates a dedicated fund for the very businesses that made that slogan possible and employ thousands of musicians, hospitality, event, and production staff? Thread Gills, Barracuda, Shady Grove, I could spend my entire two minutes listing the venues that have already closed or musicians who are forced out of the city since the pandemic began. You have the data. You know what's coming. Yet time and time again, when Austin Music is given some promise of hope with an ordinance or resolution, council waters it down and won't take decisive action to help save our stages. Instead, venues and musicians are lumped in with other small businesses and forced to jump through hoops just for what? To take a chance on a lottery? It's wrong and it's shameful. Austin isn't the small business capital of the world. Other businesses aren't driving billions of tourism dollars to the city's bank accounts. It wasn't just any small businesses that made Austin a beacon to the rest of the world. It was the musicians creating music in live music venues that sent that signal out. But that signal is dying. Our music venues are out of time. Please do the right thing. Create a dedicated live music venue preservation fund now to make sure those venues have men that have managed to hang on for this long still have a chance musicians need places to play when the lights come back on and to send that signal back out to the world austin's music community is watching and we will remember when it's time to vote thank you <laughs> i mean that is a master class in music activism and citizen engagement. So first of all, thank you for, for that and for your passion and, and for letting us, um, letting us play that clip and, and Aaron Myers in DC, I'm, I'm sure that's resonating with you as well. I mean, you've, you've, you've given that speech in different permutations, I'm, I know. Mm -hmm.